Welcome to Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, also known as Fort Mose. This is the location where the Africans had escaped to from South Carolina in the late 1600s, early 1700s to the point where they finally eventually formed their own little community just outside of St. Augustine. This new community here was a community that was, the purpose of it was really to defend St. Augustine from the encroaching British. All right, so the blacks that escaped down to this area here, if they served in, to, in the military, their freedom would be recognized and acknowledged by the Spanish. Uh, but that's not to say that only all the Africans that came down here were in the Spanish military, but the ones that chose to sign up for the Spanish military in exchange for their protection, in exchange for their recognition of their freedom, came to this location here. A lot of other ones went and created their own independent maroon communities throughout Florida. Others went and mixed in with the Native Americans throughout Florida. But this is one of the options that the Africans actually had, was to form this community here known as Fort Mose. Though Spanish Florida was a much better option than British Carolina, when the Africans first escaped into the Southern Peninsula, their treatment wasn't always pleasant. In the 1720s, Governor Antonio de Benavides attempted to put the self-liberated Africans in an indentured status under the state, in some cases resulting in their sale back into slavery. One African veteran of the Yamasi Wars, Francisco Menendez, was appointed by the governor to command a black militia in 1726. Menendez and his African men fought valiantly in defending Florida from the British invasion in 1728. It wasn't until 1737 that their petitions for true freedom and not indentureship would be realized under the new governor, Manuel de Montiano. On March 15, 1738, unconditional freedom was granted to the black freedom fighters in and around St. Augustine. This is what led to the creation of Port Mose. The freedmen built the settlement, which contained a walled fort and shelters that the Spanish described as resembling Indian huts. British observers described the walled fort as being constructed with stone, four square with a flanker at each corner 
banked with earth, having a ditch without on all sides, lined around with prickly royal, and had a well and a house within, and a lookout. This fort has since been destroyed, and the only thing left are the memories. The Africans also planted crops on the fertile lands around the fort. There was an abundance of salt water surrounding the area where they sustained themselves on an abundance of fish of all kinds. The Africans at Fort Mose engaged in trade with the Spanish at St. Augustine. It is estimated that around 70% of Africans imported into South Carolina during the late 1730s arrived from the Congo-Angola region. Many of them were escaping towards St. Augustine. The Spanish kept records of the nation of origin of the Africans, and though not always accurate, it gives an idea of the predominance of the Congo culture in the region. Go ahead. A very interesting thing here about this is what you see here is African symbols. This symbolizes the Congo cosmogram. A lot of the Africans that actually escaped down into Florida were from South Carolina, and many of those imported into South Carolina actually came from the Congo. And this is the Congo cosmogram, which represents the circle of life. This represents birth, maturity, death, and the afterlife. This part right here is also known as noon or ntoto. This represents uh, midnight, mbemba. This represents masculinity, femininity, and this represents the circle of life. All right? Reincarnation. Congo Cosmogram. Counterclockwise motion. Vestiges of the Congo Cosmogram can be found throughout the African diaspora today in symbols like the Haitian Vev in Palamonte in Cuba and in the counterclockwise spiritual dance known as the Ring Shout. There is also evidence of the Congo Cosmogram symbolism along the Underground Railroad. Between 1735 and 1763, there were 147 black marriages reported. 52 of them were designated as Congos, while the next largest group were the Caravilis, who were most likely to be Igbo, and the third largest group was the Mandingos, or Mandinka. According to records, the people of Fort Mose were remarkably adaptable. They spoke several American indigenous, European, and African languages. They brought with them their own African culture, but were very open to adopting Spanish and Native American culture. After a year of this formally established fort, the word spread about this African sanctuary in Spanish Florida, which compelled Africans in Carolina at the time to engage in the largest slave rebellion in British North America up to that date, known as the Stono Rebellion. So we are here in uh, Fort Mose. Fort Mose became so popular that in 1739, in South Carolina, you had what was known as the Stono Rebellion. And the Stono Rebellion was a rebellion in which, in South Carolina, near Stono River, where you had Africans of Bakongo ancestry, or who were actually Bakongo themselves, imported straight from Central Africa, who decided to rise up against their masters, break into a gun store, and liberate themselves from slavery. And the goal was to reach down into Spanish Florida. Uh, John Thornton, historian, he actually writes about the fact that a lot of these people that were from the Congo were actually Catholic, or if not Catholic, had some Catholic understanding, and some of them actually spoke Portuguese. So we all know that Spanish and Portuguese are mutually intelligible languages, so they, they looked at this as an inspiration as well to go down into Spanish Florida because they can also understand the reading, the language, and also understand the Catholic religion being practiced in Spanish Florida. So yeah, this is where this is where uh, some of the freedom fighters of African descent decided to reside. Many of whom were of were of Congolese descent, or what I call the Congo descent. And uh, that's why you see the Congo cosmogram and those kinds of things over here. But this is the location that you see around here where they would have resided um, during this time, and this is where they. They engaged in all kinds of activities. Some of them were blacksmiths. Some of them were just were 
purely soldiers. Some of them were uh, cattle ranchers. Some of them were farmers of other types. But they made themselves a living here. And this is one of the many options in which uh, runaways uh, decided to uh, practice their freedom. Like I explained before, many of them actually escaped into uh, other parts of Florida as independent Maroons, while you had some that actually escaped and lived alongside the Native Americans. Port Mose. This historic site, established in 1994, actually provides a great deal of African history as well as the history of African resistance to enslavement here in Florida. The curious part about it is that it is segregated from the history of St. Augustine at the San Marcos Castle attraction, just two miles away. Pater Noster, Cuyos in Chalis, Sanctificator Nomen Tuum, Adveniat Regnum Tuum. My name is Anna, and I'm an American Indian. I escaped from Carolina with my husband, Francisco Garcia. We became slaves in St. Augustine for a prominent Spanish family. The Spanish system of slavery is different from the English system. In St. Augustine, we were paid for our labor and allowed to live together. We were baptized and married in the Catholic Church. When our daughter Francisca was there, she was baptized too. The video you are about to watch shows actual footage from the excavations at Fort Mose that took place from 1986 to 1988. Before archaeologists could begin studying the site, they had to find it. Listen as project archaeologist Dr. Kathleen Deegan explains how they discovered the site's location. We had 
maps of the fort from the 18th century that were quite detailed and they showed the streams and the fields and the fort itself in a, a way we could relate to the present landscape. And we compared those maps to aerial photographs of the area today and were able to pinpoint where those should be uh, according to the 18th century maps. Actually, we scaled the 18th century maps to the same scale as the modern aerial photos and then we printed them on clear plastic and did an overlay and we could see just where the fort should be. And it was, in fact, on the island we've been looking at all along. When we compare the maps and streams to the uh, present waterways, we could pinpoint pretty well where that should have been. Then the idea was to excavate in the spot we believed it was, and if it was the fort, there should be artifacts dating to the fort's time period, and there should be moat and, and uh, evidence for the earthwork, and all those things we did find where we expected them. An excavation team from the Florida Museum of Natural History headed by archaeologist Dr. Kathleen Deegan and graduate student John Marin, began to investigate the site. This is the bottom of the moat as it appears in the ground. The moat was filled in after the fort was abandoned and today appears as a dark stain in the soil. The dirt and shells above the moat were deposited on the ground after Fort Mose was abandoned. Most of the dirt in the site is Africans continue to run away to support the black contingency in independent black communities of Florida. However, this would all come to an end after the Seven Years' War when the British defeated the French and their Spanish allies, resulting in the cession of Spanish Florida to the British in 1763. The Spanish and their African allies living in and around Fort Mose evacuated the region, moving to Matanzas, Cuba. However, though many blacks left with the Spanish in 1763, there were smaller maroon communities, some independent, and others that allied with the natives that remained in Florida. <laughs>